How do you feel about Minister Farrakhan coming to speak to Tallahassee, in Florida, on the World Day of Atonement? I feel like that's what Tallahassee needs. All of Florida needs it. Yes, sir. Love Minister Farrakhan. It's your first time seeing him live? No, sir. No, sir. I basically try to get wherever Minister Farrakhan is. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much, sir. How do you feel about Minister Farrakhan coming to speak to Tallahassee, Florida on the Holy Day of Atonement? I think it's fantastic, and everybody ought to be involved with this and to hear what he has to say. Is your first time seeing him live? Live, yeah. I've read that paper, though. All right, thank you very much, sir. How do you feel about Minister Farrakhan coming to speak to Tallahassee Fraud on the Holy Day of Atonement? I think that it's a wonderful um, um, ideal. Um, both Florida State and FSU students really need atonement, um, along with the community of Tallahassee. Um, Minister Farrakhan has messages that will both inspire us intellectually and spiritually. And I'm just really excited to hear his word, what the message that he has prepared for us today. It's your first time seeing him live? No, it's not. I saw him on Michigan State campus in Michigan, <laughs> and this will be my second time seeing him. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. I'm here because I'm interested. I don't know very much about what he has to say other than what the press reports, so I thought I'd hear for myself what he has to say. It's your first time seeing him live? Yeah, I've never. I'm from the West. So there, I'm from Utah, it's 98% white, so it's not something you'd have to get every day in Salt Lake. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed him, and as a result, I, there was a lot of common playing field after I listened to him, and there was a lot of misconceptions, but after following him and kind of keeping up with him after that, I found out that um, some of the things that he's doing for our people is real good, and to have him here is really needed. And I'm, I'm hoping that more people turn out to hear him, and as a result, more people will come together, our people as a whole, put, a, put aside the differences and see the things that we have in common, and let's go together so that we can, as a people, make a difference. How do you feel about Minister Farrakhan coming to speak to Tallahassee, Florida on the Holy Day of Atonement? Well, I think it's a very, you know, beautiful thing for Tallahassee. I, as a matter of fact, I think uh, Tallahassee is blessed to have him come because uh, he's bringing the same message that he carried to the Million Man March. I was there and I heard that message and a message of atonement and better communities and better race relations, I think it's a message that's as long overdue in Tallahassee. And uh, Minister Farrakhan being the electrifying minister that he is, I think he's more than able and qualified to deliver that message. And I will concur with Brother Colbert. I was at the Million Man March also, and I'm further endorse this the right type of black leadership that needs to come to Tallahassee. And when Farrakhan comes in, black folks here to stand up. He's a stand up brother. Absolutely. He's a stand up brother. The stand up brothers behind me. And as we come to hear his message today, to give us some power, minutes, some strength. And then hopefully, the, the goal is today and bringing it is to, to let the community know that there is some black leadership who's about telling the truth. And that's what he's doing, not telling the truth. And he takes on a battle for years. And wherever we go, I'm going to be here to support him. Would you join me in welcoming at the podium our big brother and our friend, Minister Ray Muhammad from Tallahassee, Florida. Give him a big round of applause. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I greet you again with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Are you excited in here tonight? Let's let them know on the outside that we are excited about being here with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He's in Tallahassee and he's on his way just minutes away from this venue, brothers and sisters. What I want to make known is this. You know, I heard the reports from those, uh, uh, Rabbi Ron Goff in particular, who said he didn't want to meet with Minister Farrakhan because he's one who teaches hate. And I don't know if the rabbi knows, but he's one of those who helped me to become a follower of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Because as a student at Florida State, a friend of mine worked right up in the synagogue. And I went one time to escort my friend home from the synagogue. And when I came in, they didn't ask me, do I want to read the Torah? They didn't ask me, do I want to learn more about God and about Judaism? They asked me when I walked into the building, the first thing that they asked me was, do you like Farrakhan? Well, at that time, I was unfamiliar with the minister. And so I didn't know what to say, but I wondered why they would ask me that. And I went back and researched that one that they were talking about and accusing of all of this hate. 
And when I went and looked at him and when I went to his mosque, he didn't ask me, do you dislike white people? He didn't ask me, do you hate Jews? As a matter of fact, like the Good Samaritan, he looked at me and saw that I had a gaping wound with the, lo I was losing blood or losing the knowledge of self. And when he saw me, he didn't ask, who do I dislike? He asked me, brother, do you want to know, the, do you want to get to know God? He asked me, do you want to improve your condition and improve the condition of your people? And when I told him yes, he simply told me a program that would help me to improve myself. So I don't see that as a hate teaching. As a matter of fact, I see that as the kind of teaching that black people, white people, all people all over the world, if we want to be successful, we need to follow the kind of leadership from a man like him who will help us to improve ourselves and our condition. He's teaching us as black men how to be better fathers, sisters. He's teaching us as black women how to be better wives to our husbands. Is that right? Farrakhan's concern is the family unit. America talks about improving the family unit, but you can't improve the family unit without God. Is that right? Well, Minister Farrakhan, like Joseph in the Bible, even though the naysayers continue to prick at him and probe at him and continue to try and yell all kinds of false accusations at him, continually he continues to uh, focus on God. And when we look at this man, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I'm fired up. I, I hope you can tell because I want it to be known that there is no city in the world too large and no town too small where people are suffering and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is not concerned about the condition of those people. So he's here in Tallahassee, Florida, where we are really not equipped as a town to accommodate him. But he insisted that he come here because he wants you and I to know that we are on his mind. You understand that? In the Bible, if you are a Christian and you are wondering what Minister Farrakhan will teach, because I saw those who were protesting outside, and they had to sign, read the Bible and not the Quran. And I think it's good advice for them to read the Bible, because if they would study the Bible, they will find that Jesus had a government on his shoulders. And if one like Jesus is to be in our midst today, he will be opposed by Pharaoh. Is that right? He will be opposed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they will be concerned because in spite of all of their opposition, when they look at that man like Jesus, when they study Jesus, they said, my God, even as we oppose him, the people continue to listen to him. Surely we have to deal wisely with this man because if we leave him alone, everyone will follow him. Is that right? Well, even as Minister Farrakhan is the most opposed man on the planet by the American government, he is still successful. And in 1995, they found themselves in awe because on October 16th, the minister called successfully by the grace of God. We know it was more than one million. It was, in fact, it was about two million black men assembled on the mall at Washington, D.C. They weren't there to sell drugs. We weren't there to try and find loose women and run around and cavort with dictators and thugs. Is that right? We were there to atone before God and to accept responsibility as black men to our women and our children. That's the kind of program that Jesus teaches. Is that right? Well, if we look today, there's one who is facing the same kind of opposition. And surely there's concern from the top down that if they leave this man alone, that if they leave him alone, all will follow him. Not because you are personality worshipers, but because you are people of God and your desire is to reconnect with God and you know a man of God when you see him. Is that right? Regardless of what religion he calls himself by, religion is not what you preach, it's what you practice. And so when we see that man, we see him practicing freedom, justice, and equality. We see him representing the downtrodden and the oppressed. So brothers and sisters, this is of concern of other people because they cannot stop them and they don't know how to deal with them. So they'll come out to protest Minister Farrakhan, but he's not in here selling drugs and he's not in here selling alcohol. When you leave tonight, ask the protesters if they will go and protest the condition of the French town community. Ask them where they protest the sale of alcohol. Ask them where they protest the import and export of drugs from America. Ask them where they protest racism and oppression. Ask them where they protest the condition of black people who have been forced to be on welfare and had it snatched away. We see what their priority is. Right. They are not here because they love you, for if they love you, they would love our Father. Is that right? right. 
Well, we know that our father in our midst today is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, our big brother, who is teaching us the Word of God, and we, like Jesus, want to be children of God. Is that right? So we can say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Is that right? Thy kingdom come. Well, if the kingdom is to come, then there must be a people who will bring it into existence. And I'm ready to tell you tonight that if you don't know, you are the beloved of God. You are the chosen of God. And you are equipped with the best leadership that the world has ever seen through the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as expressed by Minister Louis Farrakhan today. Are you ready to hear from Minister Louis Farrakhan? From what I understand, he's in the building. So let's let him know that we want to hear from our minister. Give him a round of applause. That one who is a freedom fighter for the black man and woman throughout the world. Let him know that we are excited, that we love him. I want the press to get a picture of black people standing for this man, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you for the law. Farrakhan. Proven there's no town too small where he will not come to the aid of the oppressed. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his goodness and his guidance to the human family. We thank him for Moses and the Torah. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran. I am eternally grateful to Allah for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master W. Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi or guide who came among us and raised from among us a divine leader and teacher for us in the person of the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalam Alaikum. To Brother Minister Ray Muhammad and all of the believers here in Tallahassee and to the distinguished uh, platform guests, reverend clergy, ministers, student leaders, my dear and beloved friend, Dr. Naeem Akbar. And to each and every one of you, I am more than honored to be here at this tremendous institution of learning, Florida State University, to bring to you a message of hope, but a challenge. Before I begin, I want to say how honored I am that Professor Naeem Akbar has honored me tonight with his presence and how grateful you must be to have such a brilliant man as one of your professors.
It has been a little over 20 years, I believe, since I was here. And a lot of things have happened since then. I guess I've become somewhat notorious. But I'm so thankful for those of you the way you responded to me you already know me but those who don't know me who are victims of what you read I would hope that you would weigh my words very very carefully and come to your own independent judgment of Louis Farrakhan I was very grateful today that his honor the mayor of Tallahassee no matter how busy his schedule took time to come out to the civic religious and political leadership meeting to hear what we had to say many of the top officials of the city were present and we were honored to by their presence but tonight is significant because this institution of learning one of the great institutions not only in the state of Florida but in the United States as well that boasts so many I think national championships with the great Seminoles. But tonight, I want you to reason with all that you know, all that you have been taught, bring it to bear on what I say. A college campus should never be afraid to listen to any voice in the society. For truly, the young people who study here will have to meet these voices and these ideas when they leave the university and if you are confident that you have done your job well there is no need for you to fear that your students will be persuaded or dissuaded from what you have taught them if you're sure that you have taught them the truth The fear of Louis Farrakhan is really unfounded. I want you to know from the outset that Louis Farrakhan is not a hater of white people or a hater of Jewish people or a hater of Catholic people or a hater of gay people. Louis Farrakhan is a lover of truth and righteousness and I dislike intensely injustice. Injustice is what is crippling human beings in their ability to relate to government and to one another. And this crippling can only be healed when truth is told, when truth is understood, and when the principles of truth are followed by those 
who claim to love truth and to love justice. America has always spoken the right words, but her deeds have not measured up to the good words. We know that the Constitution written by some very brilliant human beings, the founding fathers of this great nation, wanted the government that they were forming to be a protector of certain unalienable rights that are endowed to each human being by our Creator. And whenever governments are formed to protect those rights, to secure those rights, if the government is strong in the pursuit of the protection of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, for all of her citizens, that government has a chance for perpetuity. We live in a world that has seen the constant rise and fall of nations. They rise on the basis of certain principles that they follow, and they fall on the basis of certain principles that they violate. The question before us today, if America is founded and the government is founded on the basis of securing for the citizenry life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, are we the black, are we the red, are we the brown, worthy of these unalienable rights? And is the government really working to protect and guarantee these rights with the poor, the weak, the black, the red, the brown are concerned. If these rights are only for whites and for certain classes of whites, then the government ultimately will have to face the growing dissatisfaction of her citizenry. Yes, sir. I want you to reason with me because in the last election for the presidency of the United States, less than half of those eligible to vote took part in the greatest exercise in a free democratic society, which is the right to cast a vote for your leadership. And if less than half of those eligible to vote cast a vote, what is the state of mind of the other half that refuse to even take part in the exercise? And if President Clinton was voted into power with just a little over half of the half that chose to vote, then he has no mandate to govern from the American people. If now all of those people opted out of the process and a little less than 25% voted against him, then there is intense 
dissatisfaction in the country. And out of that dissatisfaction, there is a growing alienation of the citizenry from its government. These are not good signs. They are signals that something is wrong and the wise should do their best to analyze this and make the proper corrections for America is headed for anarchy and a total breakdown in the society if this dissatisfaction continues. Now, Timothy McVeigh, a decorated American soldier, blew up a federal building because he was so hateful of his own government that he would kill innocent people to make a point. The rise of the militia in America. These are not coops. These are not nuts. These are people who feel that the government has literally betrayed the American people. The question is, are they correct? If so, what is the solution? Now, America, no doubt, is the greatest nation on this earth, the greatest nation in the history of the present world. She leads the world in science and technology. She has the greatest uh, infrastructure, telecommunications, the most marvelous cities in the world. She has the greatest hospitals, but yet the nation is sick. She has more people in insane asylums and that are walking the streets on certain mind controlling drugs than any nation on earth. This is the most violent society of any nation on earth. There are more murders committed in America than in any nation on earth. More robbery, more rape, more brutalizing of women, abuse of children. America affords her citizens the greatest opportunity, yet America is the greatest consumer of illegal drugs. The society, in terms of buildings, is magnificent. But in terms of people, the uncultivated human being is more dangerous to the internal peace and security of America than any outside enemy. No more superpower, just America. But as we speak, the country is dying from an internal rot produced by moral decadence. Even a beautiful campus such as this. The lifestyle of the students, the behavior of the students is not harmonious with the search for knowledge. And what good What good is it for you to be 
a Rhodes Scholar, whatever that is, and lack moral turpitude or correctness. What good is it for you to gain all of these wonderful degrees but are weak in character development? And I humbly submit to you that until America develops character along with intelligence, then intelligence without character makes human beings devils. I'm going to say that again. Intelligence without the development of character makes human beings devils. If you open your Bible to the book of Revelations, it talks about a mystery Babylon. Now we know if there's a mystery Babylon, we can learn about the mystery Babylon from studying the ancient Babylon whose history we have. Ancient Babylon was a great city. Its merchant fleet carried its wares to the ends of the known world. But she was corrupt. Her wicked kings Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar had the Hebrews in their midst whom they had mistreated. According to the book of Daniel, these Hebrews were highly learned people. They knew mathematics, they knew science, but they were brought into Babylon to be made slaves. Their names were changed. Their language was changed. Their diet was changed. And God was displeased because of this. So there was some handwriting on the wall in blood. And the words that were written in blood were Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufasin, but the king couldn't read the handwriting that was on the wall. So God had raised somebody from among the Hebrews to read the handwriting. And the pattern of God is the same. Whenever there's a great and a mighty nation that has erred from the straight path of God and become utterly corrupt, when God sends a warner, he raises the warner not from the privileged class, not from the people who are the children even of the oppressor. He always goes to the bottom here and he picks one from among the abject, from among the despised, from among the rejected. And this is to humble a proud king and a mighty ruler whose wealth, power, and influence has blinded that leader to the little things in the society that is causing it to decay. So the king could not read the handwriting on the wall, so the Hebrew boy had to read it for him. It said, your kingdom has been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Babylon could have been healed 
but it was not because the proud arrogant mentality of the rulers weighed heavily against their acceptance of the message of Daniel Pharaoh's proud arrogant mentality weighed heavily against his rejection of Moses and it appears that whenever there's a great nation such as this and a great people such as this you cannot hear a warning if it comes from somebody that you don't expect it to come from well God why didn't you send us a professor from Florida State University maybe we, we would have heard you why did not you send us a Harvard graduate why did not you send us one of our fellow great ones but you insult us by sending us one of our slaves so if you cannot hear a cry from beneath you then your house will come down around you and to to those of you who love Jesus and that should be all you know we wouldn't care as black people what color Jesus was because we could accept him as a white person because we are not looking for color we're looking for salvation <laughs> but I want the whites to answer the question could you accept Jesus if he were non-white no I'm just raising a question and I literally want you not to answer openly but in your heart what 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 no I'm not trying to be smart or funny and I'm not trying to embarrass anyone this is serious and it's not uh, it's not about joking it's very serious because if Christ holds the salvation of the world in his hands you want to be able to receive him on his return but what would you do if he came back and he didn't look like the way you think he should look see the Bible and I gotta bring Billy Graham as a witness here because you know Billy is a great great evangelist and years ago in the 60s when he was teaching in Africa he told the people there that Jesus was a black man now of course that may shock your ears but in the private chambers of the Pope wait 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 he has a picture of a black Madonna and a black baby Jesus since he's Polish you know in, in Chester I think is the name of, of it they have this black Madonna all over the world there's this black Madonna but in America we've never seen it why is that now, now the Bible tells you that Mary was an Egyptian woman of course you know Egypt is in Africa and 
again. Not that I'm teaching you anything that you don't know. And the Bible teaches that Jesus had hair like lamb's wool. Something like some of the black students that are here or the black people that are here. And his feet were like burnished brass. Now, it really don't make any difference to me if he were blown or blue-eyed. I'm just telling you the truth. Because when you mature, you see beyond color. You know? But how mature are you? that you knew he was black and then painted him white. Mm -hmm. Now the whole world is looking for Jesus to come back. But it's interesting, you know, if the FBI is present tonight, They usually have the 10 most wanted, and they give you a description. Right. Five foot 10, 180 pounds. He has a scar on his right cheek and a tattoo on his left arm. And so when you see him, oh, that's the guy. Better call the FBI. But if Jesus is coming back, it would seem to me somebody would know how he looked so you wouldn't miss him. <laughs> so, so, my friend, I want us to challenge racism tonight. Oh, you do, Farrakhan? Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Yes, I do. I want us to challenge bigotry. Yes. I want us to challenge anti-Semitism. I want us to challenge homophobia. Anything that is a deterrent to human progress toward God, I would like us to challenge it tonight and I am willing in the challenge to challenge myself. And if I am that, I have to repent and reform. But if you've been lying on me, you have to repent and reform. Now, tonight, I want to move uh, very quickly because my purpose being here is to ask us in observation of the second anniversary of the Million Man March to take part in a holy day of atonement reconciliation and responsibility for it is my firm belief that we will never heal the breach between us as a people and one another or us and white people or us and other people until all of us heal the breach between ourselves and our Creator It is only when we can be clear of sin that we will be able to have vision to be able to perceive reality properly. Now, many of us do not realize the impact 
of sin on the human mind. And since I have my great brother and friend and professor, Dr. Naeem Akbar, who is a supreme psychologist, I want you to listen carefully to what we say tonight because most of you who have doctorate degrees have not the power to heal anything that is sick in the society you are not the healer now this is sad to me that you could be a doctor of sociology you some um, group read your dissertation is that what they call it yes and you defended what you researched and wrote and you were conferred a degree that should say you in your discipline a doctor of sociology should have some ability to heal the social problems of the country but you can't heal it right doc right 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 now somebody has a doctorate in history but you can't prophesy then you really don't understand all right. All right. the ever repeating cyclical nature of history so that if you see the pattern from yesterday you should be able through an intense study of history to begin to predict the future and correct the future before the future happens. You are not that wise. Sorry. You go to theology school and you get a DD, Doctor of Divinity. The nature of the human being is divine. Doctor, why can't you heal his sin-sick condition and manifest the divinity of the human being? You can't do it, Doc. See? We're doctors of psychology, but the sick minds are there big field for you to work in but still sick and oftentimes those who have the conferred degrees are in need of healing sometimes sometimes I look at these wonderful institutions and I wonder why they are charging us for an education. Listen, 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 just listen. If you come out of here and you cannot work to make this world a better place and make yourself a better person, then somebody is perpetrating a fraud. Now, you know, they brought a lot of black students in. I don't know whether it was for football or for basketball or for track, but you were here. What are you studying, brother? Oh, um, I'm in phys ed. You mean 400 years of toting that barge and lifting that bale hasn't given you a good knowledge of phys ed? 
See, you'll get a degree, but you will not be able to market your degree in a real world. Are you here for black studies? Go market it. This is a world now that is increasing in science and technology. And if you cannot come into this world with mathematics and science and engineering and, and computer skill and technology, you get lost, brother. You got the paper and you can say, yes, you know, I, I graduated from Florida A&M and I graduated from Florida State. You see my, you see, you see, you see my paper. I wonder sometimes why people invest so much money in education. And so many people come out uneducated. See, to me, to me, real education has to be the full cultivation of the human being on every level not only intellectually, but morally, spiritually, physically, that when you are truly an educated person, then the difficulties that you face in life, you can overcome the difficulty, not with drugs or with alcohol, but with the wisdom that you have learned in your education. Now, I'm asking us if we would observe a holy day of atonement so we can begin to get off of us the burden of sin. Now you may not think that sin is a burden, but in the Quran it talks about the earth shaking as though it had received a revelation and the earth would cast off its burden. The earth is not burdened by what is on it for everything on it comes up from it. So you can build buildings in wilderness but where did you get your building? Yes, sir. You got it from the earth. So you built it up on the earth. So we say, wow, this is a new city, beautiful. But you haven't changed the weight of the earth for everything that's on the earth was in the earth. So the earth's weight remains constant. But what is the burden? All right now, Brother Minister. The burden that the earth is carrying is the wicked. Since the earth was never created by God for unrighteous people to inhabit it, then wherever unrighteousness is, the earth is groaning under the weight of the unrighteous. And if we, we, all of us, who are guilty of unrighteousness, do not have a way of relieving ourselves of that burden, then we lose mentally. That's right. Let me show you what I mean yes. by the grace of God. The mind is the most undiscovered, undeveloped universe. We're out in space looking at Mars and Jupiter, Uranus and Pluto and studying rocks. But this that we have with us <laughs> is so magnificent and powerful, but it is undiscovered and its power is untapped. 
The mind is like a plane of glass or plain glass that light comes through it like something that is translucent. Sin has the effect of like painting on the glass. Every time we break divine law, it's like painting the glass. After a while, you can't see through it anymore. Clearly, you may see shadows, but you can't see the description of what's on the other side of that glass. So you have to go by what you feel because you've lost your vision. The Holy Quran teaches it like this. It says, we leave you alone in your inordinacy, blindly wandering on. So breaking divine orders, disobeying God, there is a consequence. And the consequence first is seen, you lose vision. Then you lose hearing. Mm. When I say you lose hearing, I mean that you can't see anymore as clearly. You misperceive reality because sin is a blinding thing. Then when you get so used to doing wrong, you do not want to hear anything that would correct you in your wrong, so you become deaf and blind.